Did New Jeans copy jeans? And did Seventeen copy Espa? And did the Seraphim copy? <laughs> Hive groups are not okay right now. But also, let's talk about Guhara's part in taking down Burning Sun. All of those subjects and more in today's episode of Totally Legit K-Pop News with me, Angelina. So if you're interested, then please keep on watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with friends you don't have. Don't forget to check out my link tree for super important links to check out. And without further ado, let's get into today's news. Oh. So, New Jeans copied a Mexican group <laughs> called Jeans, apparently. You know, it's one thing for Hybe to be feuding with its sub-label Adore, but it's been such a mess for the groups involved. And with all these accusations that Eyelid copied New Jeans, now we have accusations that New Jeans actually copied another group. Now, this wouldn't be the first time. A lot of people said that New Jeans at debut copied a group called Speed. But now they're being accused of copying a Mexican group called Jeans. So let's take a look at what evidence netizens came up with. So the first similarity, of course, is the name. New Jeans versus this group who is called Jeans. So here we see their logos, one on top of each other. I just want to see when Jeans debuted. Jeans group. Okay, 1996. So of course, 1996. There's that retro vibe, right? Which New Jeans, of course, is known for as well. Except it wasn't retro back then, but it's retro now. You get what I mean, anyways. And then there's CD, of course, being compared to this retro vibe that New Jeans has. But then we have instances of similar choreography. Now, this is important, as we're going to touch on later. Because of a new guideline being discussed in terms of protecting choreography, so here we have Jeans at the top, and they each have their hands on each other's shoulders, which is also a choreography move in New Jeans Ditto. And then the core is this Inkigayo, because of its Inkigayo, Guyo, we're going to get sued. And then we have the infamous move in Attention's choreography that a lot of people were saying eyelid plagiarized. And we see a similar move that Jeans did. So let's see what some K-netizens think of this. I was on screen recording. Ugh. I don't care. If Minhyeon does it, it's creativity. But if others do it, it's all plagiarism. Why are they complaining about eyelid plagiarizing? LOL. They copied the group name, concept, and even the music video. But when they do it, it's riding the trend. When others do it, even if it just feels similar, it's all plagiarism, lol. It would be hard for even some great artists to be this arrogant. They copied BTS's performance at Kinsung Dung and Hanbok exactly and then claimed it was original. Why are they like this? You know, it's definitely one thing to take inspiration from how could you not take inspiration there's really rarely things that are like 100 original nowadays right it's almost impossible because at one point or another there is somebody who has done it before but a lot of people are bringing up the fact that min Jin claimed that so and so group copied new jeans and saying that is quite ironic here's some more comments leaving aside whether they copied or not they definitely used them as reference 100 percent oh at this point they just stole everything honestly if you look around there are a lot of similar concepts in the world but if Minnie Jin is going to talk about plagiarism she should have been completely clean herself you could say that some of it is a bit of a stretch but the CEO did the same thing to another girl group so it's inevitable that it looks hypocritical unless it's an incredible work that's a hundred percent pure original creation they shouldn't be pointing fingers and attacking others so what do you think of the similarities between jeans from 1996 and new jeans so this comes actually not too long after the hearing that was held which actually let's recap that really quickly ahead of my deep dive video into that. So essentially there was a hearing between Hybe and Adore in regards to voting rights. She filed an injunction towards Hybe when they publicly demanded that or requested rather that she step down from her position. So this was at Seoul's Central District Court. And this hearing had the goal of banning HYBE from exercising their voting rights during the much anticipated upcoming shareholders meeting. So from what I understand, it seems that if the court rules in Min Hee favor, then HYBE wouldn't be able to request for her to step down from her position. But if they don't rule in her favor, then HYBE would be able to request this of her it is believed that the court will make a decision regarding this case by the scheduled shareholders meeting on may 31st kst if the court rules in favor of min Hidin, hybe will lose its ability to vote for min's removal as ceo of Adore. if the court rules in favor of hive min Hidin will likely be removed from her position so this is the reason for the hearing right and we've heard so much news that new jeans members even filed petitions in support of min Hidin during this hearing so this is according to yonhap news so we don't know what the letters say specifically but it seems that Min Hee legal representatives just stated that new jeans want to be with Min Hee So just 
in support of her. So let's look at a little recap of the contents of the hearing. So Hybe alleges that Min Hee Jung gaslighted New Jeans. There was an accusation that she was faking being this motherly figure towards the members. And there was even these text messages revealed where she was like calling them fat and you know, all that jazz. The agency claimed that Min Hee Jin hated working with New Jeans and had on several occasions claimed that the members were mentally weak and shouldn't be treated as artists but that they didn't provide acceptable evidence for this. The text messages, of course, were objected by a door. Then, of course, Hybe brought up the claim of shamanism once again. And then apparently the judge scolded Hybe for not sticking to the legal facts. So one of the big things that came out of this hearing was that Min Hee Jin claimed that Hybe was doing unethical album buying. Chart manipulation accusation, shall we say. Sajeki. Basically, advanced buying. It was alleged that Hybe would buy up albums in bulk from retailers to help boost the first week sale numbers they would later refund these to the retailers but strike deals for fan signs with the retailers leading the stock to be used up this is because fan signs are a method to sell albums but they usually only come later during the promotional cycle rendering it useless to boost first week sales numbers so of course we all know the importance of those first week sale numbers how record breaking they can be and so on basically she said that hybe offered this to her four new jeans but she said you know it was unethical and she refused it for them but anyways we'll save the rest of the details for when I do a deep dive into it. I just wanted to discuss it with you since it did happen quite recently. And of course, I would love to know your thoughts about it. Of course, with the knowledge that we don't have a court ruling as of now. But let's get back to the plagiarism accusations, of course involving Hive groups, but this time it's involving Seventeen. So it seems that Seventeen's recent teaser clip is being compared to Espa's. So let's take a look. I found the videos comparing Seventeen and Espa's overlapping concepts. So this is from Espa's drama schedule poster. So we have city buildings and it's cleverly showing, you know, the scheduler for their comeback at that time. Let's now compare that to Seventeen's Jungan and Wonu's first single album, This Man. So we see buildings once again with this focus on a particular building and then we pan down to this poster so let's see what some k netizens think me too i think they look different looking at that guy's ig it looks like the angle is different it's different though the four state is severe and this feels like the designer's signature style he just uses a lot of buildings in his work i'm wondering if it's the same artist now based on the comments. I don't know if I can say that the angles are similar and the way it's done is also different. Maybe just the tearing apart sound is similar if I had to nitpick. As a designer, I feel like this was a reference at best. I feel like they both made it theirs. The only overlapping items are the buildings and the LED lights. I saw that guy's works and all his works are kind of similar. I don't understand why there are talks about it. I just feel like the designer leans towards this kind of style. It doesn't look the same at all. It's so different. What's the same about it? Just because they they both have tall buildings and LED lights, it's the same concept. The angles are different and the auras are different. I don't understand what's similar. This is forced hate. So I'm reading some more comments and this is apparently the artist in question who did it for both of them, allegedly, but let's look at it. So Aspa. Nothing posted about Seventeen yet, but they also did My World, which actually Seventeen was also accused of copying the teasers for My World. I actually made a short about that, so let's take a look. Did Seventeen copy Espa? Did I film that on a potato? What the hell? There. Did Seventeen copy Espa? I've seen a lot of people noting the similarities between Seventeen's teasers and Espa's My World teasers, both featuring real world backgrounds with bouncy animations. There are, of course, a lot of people defending Seventeen, saying that this isn't an original idea but what do you think of the similarities so this artist does make quite a bit of use of cityscapes right but i have no confirmation that they're behind 17's teaser but with that of course i would love to know what you think of the similarities let me know in the comments below now our plagiarism corner would not be complete without le Seraph. <laughs> Oh my god, that sounded so shady. I just mean, like, it seems like every second day this poor group is being accused of copying something. Or is that eyelid? Point literally made that these hype groups are just going through a lot right now, going through a lot of accusations. Accusations that, sure, I have no doubt could have been brought to light had Adore not been feuding with hype. But for sure, a lot of them are only being brought up because of this, right? Or maybe this is just the state of K pop as we know it. So, the Seraphim song Easy is being accused by fans of copying Velis's cliche. So of course, let's listen through this short that I made. By the way, I have a question for my shorts because I put subtitles, right? Like I put the subtitles myself, but when I'm watching it here, there's already subtitles, but I won't go through the effort of putting the yellow subtitles 
if we can just see the subtitles up there, what do you prefer? Let me know. Anyways. So I personally hear it a little bit in the instrumental, right? Which of course could be a sample, I don't know. Now, of course, this is what fans are saying. Fans are saying that it's plagiarism. Velos has not come out and said, hey, Lil Seraphim copied me. Which I always need to point out as a distinction, right? Because if an artist says, hey, my work has been plagiarized, I think it's quite different to when fans say, hey, this work seems like plagiarism to me. Because I feel like sometimes we don't know necessarily what's going on behind the scenes, if the person got paid for it. Because I'm getting so much different information about how samples are handled. Some people are saying samples always need to be credited and then other people are saying, well, actually, if you pay a certain amount or you do this, you don't need to credit them in the credits, but the person still gets paid. But let's see what some of you had to say. The artist wasn't credited on the song, so it's not sampled at all. Why is it so hard to give credits when it's due? Why is it so hard to give credit to artists? They even took the word easy. The way they say easy in the exact same way at the exact same point in the song is thus. It does sound similar, but why is this coming out months after it released? Hello? I don't know. I guess it's a danger when a group isn't involved in the writing and producing. They take what they're given. I have no doubt that Le Seraphim had no idea their song sampled another song, but it's a shame that the songwriter took credit for it and probably pitched it as an original song. So of course, let me know what you think. Espa just had their comeback. Well... Part one of their double title track with Supernova, of course, off their album Armageddon, and the group recently appeared on Amazing Saturday. But fans are really upset at Giselle's styling. So she wore this shirt, which is basically like a square piece of fabric with these strings kind of holding it in place, and you can literally see the strap falling down. This is quite atypical in K-pop. Generally, if an idol were to wear this, you would see like, like a tube top underneath this top, right? Backs are usually covered, is what I'm trying to say. Here are some comments. Giselle's outfit. It's really not suitable for dancing. Stylist, this isn't right. Giselle's stylist is crazy. What is that? I'm scared for Giselle's outfit. Wow, Giselle's outfit is shocking. I just want to quickly look at the other members styling here. So Winter's wearing a tube top as well. It almost seems like they're not even wearing like the clear plastic straps on their outfits, which I feel like they would typically wear for music shows. Because usually for music shows, like they have the whole nine, they have so much clothing underneath their clothing and straps and this and that. But that's not it for our Espa news because recently Ning Ning has been a topic of conversation because of her name. So let's actually go to her Instagram right now because this is where it happened. So she posted this picture of a cat with a foot in its mouth. Forgot to take a pic while eating. Mia is mine. That's not what it... She forgot to take a picture at the music show. This is just a cute way of saying I'm sorry. So what's the issue here? Well, it seems that a fan responded... It's okay, Ling Ling. To which Ning Ning responded, hey, with an upset cat emoji. But from there, it seems that people kept correcting her name to names that still weren't her name. Don't do that. Her name is Bing Bing. No, 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 no. But Ting Ting. Nah, but Ding Ding. Why not Xing Xing? To which I have a screenshot here of her responding to everyone else as well saying, hey. So if we go to the original post here, the first comment is, I am not Xing Xing Ding Ding Ling Ling Ring Ring. It seems that Korean media also tends to misspell her name like this as well. And overall, just a lot of people calling this out as inappropriate. Fans have also brought up how Karina has mentioned how Ning Ning is sensitive to this. Ning Ning has already made it clear she doesn't like her name being said incorrectly. It's a matter of basic respect. I can't even believe this needs to be said. So of course, there's one thing to assume that an idol doesn't like a certain thing being done. And though you could, in theory, interpret hey in a multitude of ways, such as like literally saying hi to people, I'm assuming her own comment saying I am not these names means that she doesn't want to be called those names. But of course, let me know what you think. Okay, let's talk about Fromis 9 because people are so upset at the prospect that they might have not been paid at all since debut. So for context, the group debuted in 2018, which it 
I'm like 2018. That was like two years ago. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> so of course, they're under Pledis Entertainment, which at in 2018 was Pledis Entertainment, but now it's Pledis Entertainment under Hype. Hype has acquired Pledis Entertainment. But there was apparently a live stream where they talked about having not been paid. This is interesting because there's no screen recordings of the live stream, but rather tweets that talked about the contents of the live stream. Tweets that contain information about what the members said have since been deleted out of fear that the company would retaliate against the girl. It's a little late for that because this is all people have been talking about. Caches still remain on search engines and secondary sites. So one of the tweets read, There were many shocking things said today. Sedom said there's no hope she's holding on to now. Nakyang said she wants to receive her first pay. Jisun said she wants to wear new clothes now, etc, etc. They said so many things, but I'm really sad because we can't do anything. So apparently some fans are saying that the girls have mentioned receiving money to buy presents for their parents in the past. So maybe this whole thing has been blown out of proportion portion the girls could have meant that they have not been paid for the year of 2024 which is totally possible when was fromus's nine fromus nine's last comeback oh hashtag me now 2023 let's read what some canadizens think and then we can discuss it if she said she wants to receive her first pay then isn't it true that they haven't been paid even once in seven years even if their first pay is this year it's so dumbfounding it's may right now so it means their revenue for five months have been zero dollars they haven't gotten paid then how do they live Gasp. I presume a lot of idols have, you know, transportation, rent, food, stuff like that paid for them. But everything else until you get paid is likely not covered, right? Seeing a few comments, they apparently did say they received money to buy their parents things and stuff. I don't think they really mean their first first pay. Did they bill the members for chart manipulation? Of course they mean only this year. It's been seven years since they debuted. I bet they just mean they haven't gotten paid this year. I don't know Pilatus's pay cycles, but in the industry, it's normal to receive pay once or twice a year. It's better for them not to say this. It'll only upset the fans. This definitely doesn't help this whole narrative that Hive is neglecting Fromus 9. Now, whether they didn't get paid this year or haven't gotten paid in seven years, it does bring up the whole conversation surrounding idols and success i mean do we remember brave girls who from what i remember were about to move out of their dorms not have their jobs anymore as idols and then like a miracle their song from a couple years ago blew up i can imagine in this cutthroat industry if you're not making a significant amount of money in your comeback you're not gonna have another comeback and then how can you prove to your company that you're worth something if they won't give you the chance to have another comeback to make more money so then you're kind of stuck right and then with contracts and everything there are probably plenty of groups who are technically disbanded but just can't say anything because it's in their contract. Their contract hasn't ended for another five years maybe and they can't say anything. So it's definitely super frustrated for fans who in their mind, they're like, I, I support this group. I'll do anything for this group. But in the company's mind, they're like, well, you're just not profitable enough. So bye. Anyways, those are my thoughts. Feel free to share yours as well. Let's talk about choreography copyright because it seems in light of Eyelid being accused of plagiarizing New Jeans choreography, this has come about. Though a lot of comments are saying this was going to be a thing regardless of what happened with New Jeans. The government has started working to create choreography copyright guidelines following New Jeans situation. The guidelines are expected to include criteria for judging the originality of choreography as well as standard contracts and methods for calculating copyright fees this is absolutely wild if it is what we think it is because if a simple move like this can be copyright claimed how do you how do you choreograph anything at that point because if every single move can be copyright claimed you're not going to have dances anymore like this is my thought process in all of this because i actually had a bunch of viral videos comparing choreography moves within so many different k-pop groups like everyone does the butt centipede or like everyone does this move everyone does that move how do you copyright claim that one of the comments reads the choreographer's work needs to be protected and appreciated just like how music is protected that's a good thing to hear i mean if i was a choreographer of course i would want my work to be protected if it's like the whole entire dance is copyright protected that would make sense to me but if it's just one singular move then i don't think that makes a whole lot of sense it's like copyright claiming like a note in music how do you make music then if like every single singular element is copyright claimed to be fair it does say the originality of choreography so i feel like there's a bigger picture to this and not just because there was a couple of moves in new jeans choreography that was then plagiarized or allegedly plagiarized can you even plagiarize that type of thing
But with that, let's move on to our discussion segment. And I want to talk about BBC's newest documentary about the Burning Sun scandal. So a bit of a trigger warning for this one. We're not going to go into a lot of details, to be honest. It's just quite disturbing and sad content, to be honest. And ahead of this segment, I will link in my link tree some resources for anyone who might be struggling as it pertains to some of the content of this segment. And I want it to be a discussion because I don't want to fixate on the little nitty gritty details, like, oh, this happened on this date or this is the specific timeline of what happened. I just want to talk about what I saw in the documentary, of course, how it relates to K-pop. And if one day we want to do a deep dive into this which i super duper doubt would be possible given how i can't even say the word cult in a title of a video and i suppose just like anything there are some details that are different or there are some ways that people describe things that are slightly different so i don't want to get caught up on the little details of things but essentially the bbc released a one-hour documentary about the burning sun scandal now for context and i'll explain this as broadly as i can without getting into too many details that will derail this channel but it involved k-pop idols who filmed illegal videos and then shared them in a group chat but that wasn't it, it wasn't wasn't just like a couple people doing these things. There was also the use of certain medications to facilitate these actions. There was also involvement of the Burning Sun Club, whose employees were seemingly in on this, some police officers who were seemingly looking the other way on this. It was not just a couple of guys doing these illegal things it was a whole club providing illegal services that these girls didn't know about so of course in this documentary they do talk about the details of these horrendous things that were done and they make mention of singing of big bang chung jin young who is a soloist and tae chung Un, the lead singer of ft island so the way that anyone got the chats to begin with was actually an interesting story so chung jin young's girlfriend actually reported him for having filmed an illegal video of her but it seems that the police didn't even bother to check his phone. In fact, he refused to give his phone to the police and he instead gave his phone to a private forensics company. And they kind of just let this slide. In fact, it even seems that his lawyer tried to convince the forensics team that the phone just couldn't be recovered. However, a copy of his phone was made, which was then leaked three years later. So that's the only way we have any of these chats. And actually his girlfriend ended up dropping the case because lawyers were telling her, you know, if we don't find any evidence, then you could probably get charged for false accusations so she was scared and she dropped the charges now kbs is getting into a lot of heat because of this because it seems it was the show's lawyers who pressured her into dropping it during his hiatus kbs's legal team is reported to have contacted kyungmi which isn't her real name in an attempt to convince her to drop the lawsuit threatening her with a counter charge so she was being told if there was insufficient evidence she could end up receiving a harsh sentence for false accusation so she goes on to publicly tell everyone that nothing bad happened to her and he gets put back on his kbs show where they even did a welcome back episode for him kind of teasing him as a troublemaker so with this we have a lot of netizens demanding that kbs explain what exactly happened here there was also never before seen footage featured in the documentary there was a clip of singing like pulling a woman by her wrist i encourage you to watch the documentary if you can handle it you'll get more details on what happened they're very short sentences the years of harassment that the journalist had to endure for just simply reporting on this. Because actually, the journalist who originally reported on Jung Jin Young's case, after the girlfriend came out and said, like, nothing wrong actually happened, that journalist received so much hate, years of hate, because she ruined somebody's life. And then years later, turns out it was all true. But of course, with all this, I did want to highlight Kuhara's part in all of this. <laughs> there is a section of the documentary that talks about her importance with this case. So of course, Kuhara was part of the group Kara and unfortunately left us in 2019. But people are so touched by her actions related to this case. So she's been a topic of conversation. So what exactly did she do? So one of the journalists in the documentary is recounting how she covered the Burning Sun scandal and how Kuhara had heard about this and personally reached out to her asking, you know, how can I help with this? I want to do everything I can to to help with this. So this actually isn't information that was newly revealed by this documentary. The information that Kuhara had reached out to this reporter was revealed, I think, back in 2019. But we do get other details that we'll get into. So here's what the reporter said back in 2019. I reported on the Chun Jin Young chat room case and Kuhara personally gave me a call afterwards. She's also a victim of a similar case. So she told me, I had to contact you after seeing the article. I don't know how I can help, but I would like to help you. 
Because Cojera is a female celebrity and because she was attending court trials as the victim of illegal filming by her ex-boyfriend, she courageously asked around for my contact details and contacted me first. She said she wanted to help in any way she could to uncover the truth behind the case and she actually provided lots of help. So that was actually the extent of her involvement in the case as we knew it back then as we've known up until now but the documentary reveals exactly how she helped the case so of course she wanted to help in any way she could and because she knew the people involved she basically said you know like i've been around them and they have weird things on their phones now she herself as we mentioned was going through court because her ex-boyfriend did the same thing to her and he was actually black her and in the documentary we actually saw cctv footage outside of an elevator where she's on her knees seemingly begging him to not release the footage that he had of her because he was threatening to ruin her idol career and hada's brother was actually in this documentary as well and he was explaining this where she was at a point in her career where she was finally happy with her accomplishments and there was this man just holding all of this over her head attempting to ruin it all so at the time during the case there was one person's identity that they couldn't find because in the chats there was mentions of a policeman this is what the text said i saw you texting the police prosecutor general yesterday and i think the issue with the snitch will get sorted out too he he so when clara called this journalist the journalist honestly told her we're looking for the identity of this police person that's being mentioned in the chats just who on earth is that policeman mentioned in the katok group this was an important key point and this was the issue that was the hardest to decipher. This was additional homework for us. And Guara's identity appeared and it opened a water gate. I still somewhat remember that day. She said, journalist Nim, I'm Hara. I still remember her voice. She said, I really want to help you. I was so thankful. From that point, she convinced Che jong un to tell everything he knew to the reporter. And he did. Guara was a woman who was really courageous. When she was talking with me, no matter what I said, she always said to me, me too, I want to help. I'm a victim of this. So because of her, they were able to get the identity of that policeman involved. So of course, people are calling her a hero and rightfully calling her brave that she reached out to this journalist because she knew there was weird things going on. So let me know if you watched the documentary, what you thought of the documentary, everything in between in the comments below. So let's end off with some K-pop shenanigans, which are basically some fun little things that have happened in K-pop recently and or quick news. So they have 21 who reunited. They shared some pictures for their 15th anniversary. There was also a rumor that CL met up with YG CEO, but then YG Entertainment was like, well, it wasn't for like official YG business, so it's difficult to confirm. So kind of like trying to ruin our dreams. But what's new? XG revealed their light stick, which I already saw. It's a UFO. It was spoiled to me through a TikTok, but it's okay. <laughs> I always get unreasonably mad when these things are spoiled to me. And it's like, it's not reasonable things to get mad to be spoiled about. Cause I just, I'm like, I want to react with my audience. I want to react with you guys, but then it gets ruined. It's fine. <laughs> so it's basically a light it's basically a UFO, which is so cool. And you can interchange the XG with a wolf from what I could see. I like that the, the handle is not just circular. It just, it immediately makes a difference. Speaking of XG, Kokona shaved her head. So I've been seeing this all over TikTok. And I think it's so fun. Everglow are set to have a comeback with Zombie. That's exciting. This reminds me of Mr. Mr. My Girl's Generation. Not that it looks the same at all, but just like the... Why do I want to say UV bags? It's not a UV bag. Oh no, it was a like a, a breathing mask. This is what it reminded me of. For no good reason, it's fine. Forever's know what I did there. But we also have Stacy, who are set to have a summer comeback. I don't think there's... A, no, there's no, uh, there's no content being showed here, but... That's exciting too. So that is basically it for today's video. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with friends you don't have. These are the lovely individuals who help support my channel on a monthly basis. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. As for me, I'm going to get going. So I'll see you guys next time. Bye.